guys like Fauci get up there and start talking, you know, he doesn't know anything really about anything. And I'd say that to his face. Nothing. The man thinks you can take a blood sample and stick it in an electron microscope, and if it's got a virus in there, you'll know it. He doesn't understand electron microscopy, and he doesn't understand medicine, and he, doesn't, he should not be in a position like he's in. Most of those guys up there on the top are just total administrative people, and they don't know anything about what's going on. If Fauci wants to get on television with somebody who knows a little bit about this stuff and debate him, he could easily do it, because he's been asked. I mean, I've had a lot of people, president of the University of South Carolina, ask Fauci if he'd come down there and debate me on the stage in front of the student body, because I wanted somebody who was from the other side to come down there and balance my, because I felt like, well, these guys can listen to me, but I need to have somebody else down here that's going to tell me the other side. But it Fauci was, didn't want to do it. I don't have to answer to anybody for money. See, I don't work for some organization like that Tony Fauci happens to be the head of. The number of cases reported went up epidemically, you know, exponentially, because the number of tests that was done went up exponentially. I asked, the first time I ever saw one of these CDC graphs, it showed this thing going off the page. You know, I went up after that and I said, how did you uh, disentangle the, the, I mean, did you divide the number that you've got here by the number of tests that were done? I mean, can we believe that this line that you've drawn here about number of positive tests reported, is that really indicative of, of the spread of this virus? Is the virus getting, is there being more of it? Or are there more tests? If you divide by the number of tests you do, you don't get any kind of a curve going up. It's just those guys have got an agenda, which is not what we would like them to have, being that we pay for them to take care of our health in some way. They've got a personal kind of agenda. They make up their own rules as they go. They change them when they want to. And they smugly, like Tony Fauci, does not mind going on television in front of the people that pay his salary and lie directly into the camera. I mean, did that's... You ever, did you ever meet Linus Pauling? I unfortunately did not bother to go down there, just like I didn't go up to, to see Richard Feynman until he was dead. Because there were two people I wish I had just said hi and like shake your hand because you're cool people. I knew, uh, I knew Linus Pauling for a long time. And uh, I found it interesting that of all the Nobel laureates in the United States and around the world, he, having two unshared, and I'm not aware of any other American to have two unshared Nobel Prizes, was never respected again by mainstream medicine or science when he supported that vitamin C could cause an improvement in people with terminal cancer. And I watched, I watched how all of his funding dried up, even though he was one of the founding members of the National Academy of Science, he couldn't even get a grant from them. And it took him almost 14 years just to get a mediocre grant to study cancer. Even when the Mayo Clinic uh, supposedly reproduced his results that he had obtained at the Vale of Leaven Hospital in Scotland, where Dr. He, he and Dr. Ewan Cameron took a group of terminally ill cancer patients, divided them in half, gave half 10,000 milligrams of vitamin C every day in their life, and another group got a placebo, and there was a statistically significant improvement in the people who received vitamin C. Uh, they turned around and did it at the Mayo Clinic, but they didn't use uh, the same criteria. Pauling says, don't use people who have chemotherapy, it'll knock the liver out. They use people with chemotherapy. Pauling says, you have to give vitamin C every single day. They didn't. And so it was not the same study, yet they published it saying they duplicated his work. Then when they went to publish the results of what is a terribly flawed study, they didn't even give him the courtesy of saying, here's the results, would you like to examine it? Uh, and all he was given was a letter to the editor of New England Journal of Medicine long after the study. And I saw at that time how you can take one of the best and brightest in America, much as they did our greatest living scientist of the century, who was destroyed, Dr. Andrew Ivey. There was never a scientist who's been more cited in the scientific literature than Dr. Ivey. He was, you know, he, he, was, he was a jurist, he was a physician, he was a scientist, he was everything. But he supported Kerbiasen. And he supported Kerbiasen in a correct manner, and they destroyed him. And that's been shown. Now I'm looking at what the media has done to you, projecting you as a flippant, um, drug-taking, drug -taking, womanizing, womanizing uh, person who, has, who 
who everyone has to wonder how you even got through college, let alone got a Nobel yeah. Prize. And I'm thinking, my God, haven't we learned? Haven't we learned from Andrew Ivey and Linus Pauling and Peter Duisberg what they'll do to the best and brightest? Well, you know, you can't expect the sheep to really respect the best and the brightest. They don't know the difference, really. I mean, I, I like humans, don't, don't get me wrong, but basically there is a, there is a, there's a vast, the vast majority of them do not possess the, the ability to judge who is and who isn't a really good scientist. I mean, that's a problem, that's a main problem actually with science, I'd say, in this century, because science is being judged by people, and funding is being done by people who don't understand it. People, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people could sit down with Linus Pauling and not realize that he was a brilliant man. I mean, most people wouldn't know him from, you know, somebody who, who uh, you know, just was a little taller or something. I mean, nobody knows Richard Feynman. Or Richard did, finally showed a few people, that, you know, when he said, you know, here's the O-ring, here's some cold water, see what happens. That he at least knew how to, I mean, but no, most people don't understand what a brilliant guy that Feynman was. There's a, a handful of people at any one time in the world who are capable of really doing innovation, innovative things. And usually those people turn out to care for their fellow man, you know. They respect them in a way, although they don't think that those, that most of the people, the great masses of people, really are going to be able to understand what it is that they're doing. You know, it's got to, it, before, and before the transistor radio, most people didn't really understand who John Bardeen was, right? John Bardeen didn't know who Paul, John von Neumann was, who was 50 miles away, who needed those transistors really bad with his ENIAC. I mean, you, there's not a lot of, Specialized scientists are not. You, you don't expect every, everybody to understand what it is you did. I, I don't expect you, my, you know, my mother to really understand how clever PCR was. I just I can't explain to her. What, it, what, it was only a few people, you know, that really could see what a what a clever idea that was at first. Now everybody says, well, it's a wonderful thing because we hear about it all over the place. But but see, what I'm saying is. If you're one of these people like Linus Pauling, I'm sure Linus did not expect to be appreciated. You know, I I find the the scorn of the masses to be sort of a, you know, they they, I mean, it, if if they love you too much, you're probably doing something wrong, don't you think? I mean, the guys that are, if 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 they if they're willing to elect a president who lies right right in front of them and says, I just put it in my mouth, I didn't inhale it. And, and by the way, Mr. President, it's illegal to have it in your mouth, too, whether you inhale it or not. You know? But somehow, so it, the people say, well, that was such a clever way of getting around that issue. What is he? A, he's a real diplomat, right? He's a lying bastard, is what he is. But we elected him. You know, there wasn't a whole lot of other possibilities. There never is. It's, but that's the kind of people that you don't expect them to know whether Linus Pauling would be... You know, Linus's first paper about that business of ascorbic acid is all it took to convince me, just the theory. He says, look, here's where we came from. 20 million years ago, we're eating the tops of, of green plants, the little leaves. We're doing it all day long. It's, a very, it's not a very rich substance. But it's got a lot of vitamins in it, and we don't cook it so to destroy the vitamin C. 